This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Mountebank. We have to confess that last week's Word of the Week left a very sour taste in our mouth. Not because we dislike mayonnaise, no, no. Much to our doctor's collective chagrin, we very much like mayonnaise. But the whole thing felt very unsatisfying. In the end, we couldn't find a good reason for the inclusion of mayonnaise in D&D. And while wandering down the wordy garden path can be fun in and of itself, we do like to reach conclusions here at Word of the Week. But sometimes, we just can't get there. And sometimes, like today, we have to make a few guesses. Sometimes all we have is conjecture. Of course, our conjecture is usually pretty good, if we do say so ourselves. And we do like conjecturing. So when we mentioned that we were going to do a few episodes inspired by magical items and someone brought up the Cape of the Mountebank, we jumped at the chance to think through this particular piece of weirdness in the miscellaneous magical items section. And it took us to some very interesting places. First, the item itself. As near as we have been able to determine, the Cape of the Mountebank first appeared in the third edition Dungeons & Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide. It is described as a bright red and gold cape that allows the wearer to use the Dimension Door spell. Essentially, Dimension Door is a short-range, point-to-point teleport. Vanish from here, reappear over there. Pretty neat. And it would be nothing more than a simple teleportation item except for two details. First, there's the strange name, the Cape of the Mountebank. And second, the description specifies that the disappearance and reappearance of the wearer is accompanied by a cloud of smoke. So you've got a flashy red and gold cape that allows you to vanish and reappear in a puff of smoke. Right. Now, the puff of smoke is an example of what film enthusiasts call out as a choice. What does that mean? Well, lots of things in movies are just accidental. When you film on a street, for example, and park a bunch of cars on the street, you might be limited to whatever cars a dealership was willing to lend you, or whatever cars your crew drove to the scene. But if you see a movie with a street scene, and all of the cars parked along the street in a particular scene are red, suddenly, something seems odd. That doesn't seem like random chance. It seems like the director purposely chose to only have red cars on the street. And that means something. And that definitely happens. If you pay careful attention to the movie The Sixth Sense, for example, you'll notice that the movie is almost devoid of anything colored red, except for very conspicuous and deliberate objects. And if it weren't for the fact that M. Night Shyamalan's entire career proves The Sixth Sense was a fluke, we might suspect he was trying to symbolize something deep and meaningful. But we digress. The choice to give the cape of the mountebank a flashy red and gold appearance and to add the little detail about puffs of smoke is most definitely a deliberate choice. Almost everything in a written work is a deliberate choice. Every detail you spill ink spelling out is done on purpose. And so, we're left with many questions. Who is the mountebank? Why is the cape specifically bright and flashy? And why the puff of smoke? What, in fact, is the deal? First of all, let's talk about the name itself. See, mountebank is a real word. It comes from the Italian and it means to climb on top of a bench. And that's our first clue as to what the cape is really about. What, you don't see it? Okay, let's spell it out. See, mountebank is the Italian synonym for charlatan or quack or snake oil salesman. And all of those are just terms for a con artist. And if you didn't know, Con artist is short for confidence artist, because a con artist is someone who gains your confidence and then swindles you. The word mountebank specifically refers to the practice of a huckster climbing atop a bench to address a crowd of people, usually to sell his wares. And his wares are usually snake oil, figurative snake oil. Snake oil refers to what is essentially phony medicine. A con artist would display a bottle of some kind of tonic, claim that it was a miracle cure for everything that might ail you, and then try to get you to spend some hard-earned money on it. What's interesting, though, is that snake oil used to be a legitimate medicine, and it didn't become synonymous with a scam until 1917, and that's thanks to the same law that protects you from bad medicine today, at least if you live in the United States. In the mid-1800s, 
there was a huge jump in Chinese immigration to the United States. It's estimated that between 1850 and 1880, nearly 200,000 mostly peasant families immigrated from China. These immigrants were offered contracts which essentially amounted to indentured servitude by railroad companies looking to build a transcontinental rail system to connect the east and west coasts of America. They brought many cultural traditions with them. Among them was a technique for making a fatty oil from dead snakes. Snake oil was a traditional Chinese remedy for joint pain and other minor ailments, and it became very popular and people swore by it. Then, along came Clark Stanley, the rattlesnake king. At the 1893 World Expo in Chicago, Stanley killed a snake in front of a crowd, boiled it, extracted its oil, and claimed it was a cure-all he had discovered with the help of the Hopi Indians. He then went on to sell huge amounts of Stanley's snake oil liniment across the United States. There were a few problems, though. First, the traditional Chinese medicine was made from the Chinese water snake, not a rattlesnake. Second, Stanley's snake oil didn't actually contain any snake oil. Several medical professionals railed against Stanley's useless cure-all, but nothing could be done until the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 gave the government legal power to test food and medicines and verify medical claims. In 1917, federal investigators seized a shipment of Stanley's snake oil and tested it. They discovered it contained no snake oil of any kind. And the publicity surrounding the whole affair turned snake oil from a legitimate home remedy into a symbol of fraud. But back to the mountebank. A mountebank is just a showy charlatan. Someone with a good sales pitch, a lot of charisma, and the ability to trick people into parting with their money. A flashy, professional deceiver. And what's interesting is that even though the cape of the mountebank didn't show up in D&D until 3rd edition, the word mountebank very nearly ended up in D&D earlier. And that brings us to the story of the 2nd edition that wasn't. In 1985, Gary Gygax, the founder of TSR and co-creator of Dungeons & Dragons, was forced to leave TSR after differences of opinion with the new owners and lots of ugly money problems. It was all very bitter, and Gygax became a very vocal critic of TSR and the direction it went in after his departure. One of the things he was very critical of was the release of the second edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons in 1989. But, in fact, Gygax himself had known for some time that it would be necessary to update and revive Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. And Gygax had already started planning for what features he might include in an updated edition. In the September 1982 issue of Dragon Magazine, issue number 65, Gygax wrote an article called Character Classes to Consider. In it, he explained that he and the team at TSR were working on what he called an expansion volume for AD&D, which would contain a number of new classes. He described several classes in brief and asked readers to write in to vote for which ones they thought would be a fun addition to the game. Among them was a subclass of the thief called the Mountebank, who specialized in deception, sleight of hand, persuasion, theatrics, and illusion. Now, at the time, it seemed like Gygax was merely considering an expansion of the existing game. But in the next several issues of Dragon, he kept returning to the topic of expanding the game. Finally, in Dragon Magazine issue 103 in November of 1985, just prior to his departure from TSR, he spelled out a roadmap to the new second edition in his editorial entitled The Future of the Game, What the Second Edition Books Will Be Like. Unfortunately, many of the plans he spelled out in those and other articles never materialized. In 1989, the new Advanced Dungeons & Dragons second edition bore very little resemblance to the one that Gygax had been hinting at for several years. But that digression aside, even understanding the word mountebank as a showy charlatan who works a crowd doesn't really explain the item. Why teleportation, and why the puff of smoke? See, nowadays, we tend to associate vanishing in a puff of smoke with ninja, or at least with ninja turtles. And there is some truth to this. Even the ninja turtle part. Even though the ninja turtles got it a little confused. First of all, ninja originated in feudal Japan in around the 14th century. They were expert covert agents, spies, saboteurs, assassins, and infiltrators for hire. The techniques of the ninja were considered particularly dishonorable by the noble samurai caste. And that's because they specialized in fighting dirty. If they even fought at all. 
Now, you're probably not surprised to learn that the image of a sword-wielding warrior in black pajamas is completely mythical. In fact, there is no historical basis for the black garb of the ninja. Most ninja believed in hiding in plain sight, and ninja were masters of disguise. But, interestingly, the image of ninjas vanishing in a puff of smoke is not quite the myth you might imagine. Many ninja techniques were focused on ways to avoid detection or to escape from danger, and there were a few techniques that the ninja employed. First of all, the ninja were not above blinding an opponent to gain an advantage, something that was seen as reprehensible, and they had several tools to help them. First, they invented the Metsubishi. This was a small box or bag filled with powder or smoke. It had a mouthpiece and, when the ninja blew in it, it would expel its contents preferably in the face of an enemy. The powder and smoke was a mixture of irritants and stimulants designed to cause eye irritation, choking, and sneezing. A second form of Metsubishi was the eggshell bomb. And if you watch Nickelodeon's update of the classic 1989 cartoon show Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you've seen eggshell bombs. In one episode, Donatello hollows out dozens of eggs very carefully and fills them with smoke and powder. Michelangelo then becomes obsessed with them. He throws them down on the ground and vanishes, reappearing elsewhere. The idea is that the smoke simply covers his movements so you can't see him flee. But in the cartoon, they seem to have an almost magical power to allow Michelangelo to teleport to other rooms. Originally, they were merely thrown in the face of an adversary to blind and incapacitate. That isn't to say the ninja didn't use actual smoke grenades as we might envision them. While guns were first introduced to Japan by a pair of Portuguese travelers in 1543, gunpowder explosives had been common in China for years. The trouble was, Japan lacked one of the three key ingredients for gunpowder. Gunpowder in China was made of sulfur, coal, and potassium nitrate, which is also called saltpeter. Japan had no saltpeter to speak of. However, various methods were eventually discovered to ferment vegetation to produce saltpeter, and by the 1500s, the ninja became very good at manufacturing gunpowder. So much so that one of the 20 or so techniques included in the collective art of ninjutsu is kayakajutsu, the art of explosives and pyrotechnics. In point of fact, the ninja employed what were essentially hand grenades. Larger bombs were called hurukuhia, and smaller bombs were called toronoko. They were basically just paper-wrapped balls of gunpowder, some would be packed with iron scraps or small nails. The device had a fuse which could be cut to adjust the time before detonation. The larger ones could injure small groups of people. The smaller ones were excellent distractions. They would explode with a loud noise and a puff of smoke. Enemies would flinch at the explosion or turn to see what had made the noise, and the ninja would use the distraction to escape. This isn't quite vanishing in a puff of smoke, but the bombs just didn't provide enough smoke to cover a grown person, or turtle, dashing away into the night. Real smoke bombs, the kinds we think of as smoke bombs, weren't actually invented until the 1700s. But there is a professional group that started using smoke pellets and smoke bombs to cover their mysterious disappearances. Stage magicians. And now we're talking about real-world magic. Ledger Domain, Illusion, Conjuring, Harry Houdini, David Copperfield, David Blaine, you know. Now, Magic as a performance art has existed since almost 3000 BC. There is evidence of ancient Egyptian and Roman conjurers doing various tricks including the famous cup and balls trick. And by the way, performance magic is divided into numerous categories depending on the venue and the types of tricks being performed. Conjuring and sleight of hand are the arts of making small objects appear and disappear and move from place to place. But another famous trick is to vanish in a cloud of smoke. See, performance magic relies on a few key principles, all related to the idea of misdirection. If the audience can't see what you're doing or is looking in the wrong place or gets distracted and thinks you're doing something different, you can pull off all sorts of effects. Cover and concealment, that is, keeping the audience from seeing what you're up to, is such a central part of performance magic that two of the most common covers have become a term synonymous with magic. Smoke and mirrors. And thus you have the famous trick of the magician appearing from or disappearing into a puff of smoke. In reality, the magician sets off a smoke pellet to cover his movements. Then he drops into a trap door or off the back of the stage or behind a nearby object. Or he pops up onto the stage. When the smoke clears, 
the magician is either there or gone, depending on whether he started gone or there. But performance magicians don't merely rely on smoke and mirrors. They are also famous for something they call patter. Patter is the term magicians use to describe their charming, charismatic, entertaining, and ultimately distracting form of fast talk. Between misdirection and clever banter, one could argue that all stage magicians are basically just benevolent charlatans. Instead of using their power of deception to steal or defraud, they use them to entertain. Thus, a stage magician is nothing more than an honest mountebank. And that brings us around to the cape of the mountebank once again, a flashy, eye-catching piece of attire that emulates a classic illusion from traditional performance magic. Sadly, there isn't much information out there about who wrote the cape of the mountebank into D&D, and why and what it all means. But if we had to guess, and we do, we'd guess that it's a reference to stage magic. Of course, one wonders, and this is where we get to how you might use this in your game, one wonders what a charlatan or a mountebank might try to pull off in a world where magic exists. That is to say, are there scam artists who try to convince the world they are priests or magicians using sleight of hand, deception, and good patter? And if there are, did one of them become so skilled and famous at fake magic that his flashy cape developed some real magic? Maybe the mountebank has a capital M. Maybe there was a specific individual, THE mountebank, who was the most famous pretender magician ever. Maybe THE mountebank was the equivalent of our Clark Stanley with his infamous snake oil. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.